Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're really excited to be presenting this evening's event with the Gay Johnson McDougall Center for Global Diversity and Inclusion at Agnes Scott College, which is our school store uh, partner and college partner. Um, we are very honored to be the school store of, I should say. Um, we're here welcoming Kate Kelly in conversation with Carol Jenkins for a discussion of ordinary equality, the fearless women and queer people who shaped the US Constitution and the Equal Rights Amendment. Ordinary Equality digs into the fascinating and little known history of the ERA and the lives of the incredible and often overlooked women and queer people who have helped shape the US Constitution for more than 200 years. Kate Kelly is a feminist, activist, and human rights lawyer. She holds a JD degree from American University, Washington College of Law, the only law school in the country founded by and for women. She's a nationally known advocate for the ratification of the Re Equal Rights Amendment and host and creator of the podcast, Ordinary Equality. Kate lives in Washington, DC with her partner, Jamie Manson. And I put her Twitter and other contact info in the chat so you can follow there. And she's joined by the esteemed Carol Jenkins, who is an advocate for human, civil, and women's rights, an award-winning author, and Emmy-winning former television journalist. Carol is president and CEO of the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality, sister orga organizations dedicated to the adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment. As former chair and current board member of AMREF Health Africa USA, an arm of the largest health NGO in Africa, Ms. Jenkins is engaged in efforts to support health programs for African women and girls. She also serves on the boards of several feminist leadership organizations, as well as groups supporting the arts, excellence in journalism, and international animal rights. Ms. Jenkins earned a BA from Boston University and an MA from New York University. Both universities honored her as a distinguished alumna. She holds honorary doctorates from the College of New Rochelle and Marymount Manhattan College. Ms. Jenkins is also an author, the three-time New York Emmy-nominated host of Black America on CUNY TV, the executive producer, writer, and documentary correspondent of an award-winning film, a podcast host, and co-anchor of CUNY TV's live election night coverage. So, so, so many things. Um, and it's so wonderful to have you both here. Uh, we were joking in the green room. I just have to tell the story that uh, my initials are ERA by design because my mother is a feminist and she really wanted her child to have those initials. And so uh, I was born in 1982. My mom was pissed in 1982 that the ERA had not been ratified. She is still mad to this day um, that it has not yet been ratified, but I am delighted to be here with both of y'all to, to hear more about the history and also the current activism. So welcome to you both. Thank you both so much for being here. It's truly an honor. Well, yeah, Hello. thank you. Thank you so much. Kate, I am so happy to see you. I know that you, you're traveling, you're doing interviews all over the country. You're in Utah right now, right? <laughs> I am the Beehive State. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know it's a big, big event there tomorrow and you are from Utah and I got the longer introduction because I'm much older than you are, you know, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the way, but you're the, fu you're the future, so, which yeah. is why I'm delighted to, you know, to be in this conversation uh, with you. Uh, you know, to talk about your long love for the Equal Rights Amendment, this fantastic book, you know, which is you will be able to see when you get your copy that it is gorgeous. And not only that, but it I, it explains the ERA so perfectly that you will get it. You'll be passionate about it and you'll help us go to the next step right for it. So, Kate, people are always asking me, because we're talking about a 100-year-old effort here, they're always saying, can you just give me the short version of the ERA? And I always say, there is none. But, Kate, can you give us the Kate version of the ERA? Sure. I'll give you the elevator speech. Um, so we're, we're on the first floor. We're going to the seventh floor, and this is what I'm going to tell you about the ERA. Uh, women and marginalized genders are not in the Constitution, and that has was by design 
from the very beginning, the men who wrote the Constitution specifically and intentionally left us out. The ERA is the way that we fix that foundation, foundational mistake and get ourselves into the Constitution. Why is that important? Because we can't win in the courts and we can't get enough protection in Congress if we don't have the ERA. If we don't have a foundation in the Constitution, in the actual text of the Constitution, we will never be fully protected and we will never be full citizens. Okay, I like that. I like that. And and your book specifically talks about the queer people who are left out of this story of working for the ERA. And it reminded me of the, the gay people who were left out of the civil rights movement, like Bayard Rustin and Pauli Murray, again, left out of two movements. Uh, so talk with, uh, to us a little bit about why you determined to write this particular book, including these particular people. Yeah, so I wanted to tell stories about the people who have built the ERA and who have really been constitution makers. I want us to think about women and queer people as constitution makers. You know, when you think in your head, like who wrote the constitution, it's like a bunch of white guys in white wigs <laughs> in the 1700s. Um, and so I wanted to be a part of helping people understand that that's not the case, that all along women and queer people have been advocating for it. And I specifically say queer people uh, because I am queer uh, and I want part of our history to be out there. But also it's it's so true, like even in the suffrage times, most of the suffrage leaders, the ones who rose to the top, the ones who were um, most prominent in the suffrage movement were queer women. Uh, and the reason is they, when you married a man, you became his property. When you married a man, you lost all of your money and everything that you inherited, it became his. Uh, when you be, when you married a man back then, and to some extent today, uh, you really lost your own identity and became more of a permanent child, child rearer. Um, and so the women who were at the forefront of the feminist and, and suffrage movements did not marry men. Uh, and so they lived very queer and, and uh, countercultural, very counterculturally for the time. Uh, one of those women is Crystal Eastman. So I talk about Crystal Eastman in the book. Uh, she wasn't, she wasn't gay, uh, lamentably, but she did uh, she did, she called, wrote an article called Living Under Two Roofs. Um, and this is like, you know, at the turn of the century, she wrote about how she didn't live with her husband because she felt it more liberating to live on her own. They had separate residences and separate lives. Uh, right. And then they just raised, they co-parented their children together. So, so many of these people all along the way are, have been, always been queer. And I think it's important because that ties to the modern movement and the people who have brought forward the ERA in the modern movement, like Pat Spearman, who we love, um, Senator in Nevada, who resurrected the ERA in 2017, Danica Rome. Uh, Danica Rome is the first out and seated uh, transgender state legislature in, in US history. And Danica was one of the floor whips for the, the vote on the ERA in Virginia. And, and uh, Virginia did ratify in 2020. So queer people have always been on the forefront of this movement and are still today. So the, the book kind of tries to tie you know, from before the Constitution was written, <laughs> all the way to the modern day, and I and 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 as you noted, it is illustrated, um, and it is very informal. It uses informal language and storytelling, because I wanted people, especially young people who engage with the book, to see themselves as part of this trajectory. Well, and it's such a complex and and if I can say nerdy kind of thing. You know, it is a very one would say unromantic thing to be engaged in because, and you know this better than most because you've been in the, you know, in this movement from several power ledges where you have used your influence to move this uh, amendment along. And so you know how specifically, you know, legislatively call your senator, you know, unro you know, unsexy kind of action it takes. And, and I think what you've done in the book is to really give it a, a life of like, you know, this is fun. It's new information. All of these people have been engaged in it all of this time. And so, and you can do it too. And, you know, I think that that's that I love at the end where you say, what can you do? 
you know, join Generation Ratified, join the ERA Coalition. Thank you very much, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, so it's, you know, that whole idea of amending the Constitution, as we all know now, is not an easy thing. <laughs> I, I, I quote Crystal Eastman in the book, and she was one of the original drafters of the ERA. And she has this quote where she says, uh, a new amendment is worth it, even if it takes 10 years. <laughs> that was in 1923. So uh, right. it's, it's been longer than 10 years. Uh, but yeah, I feel like I, the other thing I really wanted to, because we can get really bogged down in the weeds right. uh, as a movement. And, and I'm happy to talk about that if pe people have specific questions about where the ERA is now and where we go next and all that. But I really wanted for the for the lay person for the person coming to this movement for the first time i wanted them to be cap captivated by these stories and by right. the people ha who had fought for it and and see themselves in those stories so that they can see themselves in the movement and then they can catch up on like what the archivist is doing and where this where the court cases are and who's voted on it and you know all this different stuff that's happening now but unless they're unless their vision of a, of a more equal constitution is, you know, if, unless we first light that candle, um, they're never going to want to be part of, of what it takes to make the constitution better. So that's kind of what I tried to capture. Um, and that's, that's sort of what first got me into the ERA. Um, you know, my mother and my grandmother fought against the ERA in the 1970s in Arizona. Arizona is still one of the states that has not ratified the ERA. So they were, they're very smart and talented people, um, you know, the people who fought against the ERA. Um, and those are the stories that I learned when I was growing up. Um, and so these very smart and talented Mormon women and other conservative women uh, defeated us in the 1970s. They kept us out of the Constitution. And, and from learning those stories, when I went to law school, then I was like, wait, my grandma did what? <laughs> You know, my grandma kept us out of the Constitution. Um, and so that is how, you know, that's how I learned about it. And that's how I kind of got engaged for the first time in this fight and, and trying to right the wrongs of the past. And, and and the important part is to is to see how we all can play as your grandmother kept, you know, us out. You know, you are putting us in. We're getting this amendment. And what I tell my grandchildren, my small grandchildren, grandchildren they were just going to Monticello and I told them say hello to Thomas Jefferson for me and mm -hmm. tell them that your black grandmother in New York City is fixing the, the amendment that he helped write uh, the constitution that he helped write you know in the founding of this country because I mean it's an enormous undertaking but the fact is that the only people who can do it are people you know who are passionate about it and I think that that is what your book will do is we'll get people passionate about it. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> um, go ahead. And sorry. I, thought about, I thought about you. I, I went to see Suffs uh, over the weekend and I know that you, I know that you've seen it too, but what is so incredible, it's about the suffragists and getting the vote, but the whole ending of the, sh the musical beautifully written and sung, and perform is about the ERA. Like, you know, it was so, and I was with Gloria Steinem, you know, mm -hmm. and, and also in that audience was AOC. And what, you know, I said to have, to have Gloria Steinem and AOC watch this, you know, <laughs> Together. I know of the ERA was, was just fabulous. But, you know, I think it's that enthusiasm to know. But the thing about it is what was so poignant was, Alice Paul, you know, uh, getting the women's vote and saying, okay, we're ready to move on. There's one more thing. And people who were with her in that movement who were peeling off saying, no, we're done. That was too hard. You know, good luck, Alice. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, I liked how they tried to capture Suffs is incredible. And anyone who's listening should definitely see it if they can. It's going to, I, think it's next it's the next Hamilton um it's gonna be so cool and um all female cast all female orchestra all female everyone in the in the in the production is is a woman um or non-binary and it's just really incredible powerful storytelling 
Um, and a lot of the characters in Suffs are actually in the book. So she talks about Crystal Eastman. She talks about Lucy Burns as a character. Alice Paul is the main character. Um, and they handle it very, very well. The, you know, they handle the racial tension in the movement very well. Um, they don't skip over it. You know, it's very clear that Alice Paul made some bad choices and was racist in, in uh, you know, in the beginning and actually towards the end of her life. Um, and so they deal with like a pretty hard subject matter in a very compelling way. Um, and I loved how at the end they tried to, the, the, there's a young person who walks in who's wearing like a now shirt and she's from the 1970s uh, talking to Alice Paul. But that moment um, I cover in uh, more depth in the book. And actually Alice Paul, you know, when, at this point she had white hair and she was elderly and, you know, it was the 1970s and she uh, really infiltrated the, the creation of now as an organization, literally like her and these older women from the national women's party went to the now meetings and they were like, how about the ERA? You know what I mean? Like they, right. they, they really in integrated it into the conversation to the point where now took on the ERA as its main platform. Uh, but that was Alice Paul. She, she like literally was the one who went to the meetings and, and got that taken on by now in the seventies. Right, right, and you mentioned the racial tension of the of of the movement, the vote, and we've been through the hundred year anniversary and explored that territory, you know, a lot. But with the ERA, it's often been you know cast as the same, you know, white women who want equal rights, but they don't want it for anyone else. And uh, talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, your book points out that people in the movement have always been you know, non-binary, you know, queer, uh, black and Latina. I mean, uh, Native American women who experienced this equality before patriarchy, can we say before or <laughs> beside patriarchy? Uh, so talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, and that's the other uh, thing that I wanted to do with the book and why I was very insistent that it be illustrated uh, because I wanted to create a different visual culture of the ERA. I know the ERA Coalition also does an incredible job at this. Um, you know, when you think of, a lot of people think of the ERA, they think like the 1970s with like Gloria Steinem and other white women marching, you know, and those are the images they have in their minds. Um, but I wanted to create a new image of who backs and always has the ERA. And that included Mary Church Terrell. You know, Mary Church Terrell was a black suffragist, um, incredibly well-educated and, uh, and, and a phenomenal organizer. And Mary Church, this isn't hyperbole, like Mary Church Terrell testified in Congress in support of the ERA. This is, you know, she, she was an explicit supporter and she actually chastised other black women's organizations who didn't support it. So she, she you can also see this in the play, but she, she sort of served as this go between between the different organizations. Um, you know, Barbara Jordan, uh, another incredible black lesbian, uh, first black woman ele elected from the South to Congress. And uh, Barbara Jordan was a big supporter of the ERA in the late 1970s when they extended the deadline. Polly Murray, of course, Polly Murray, a transgender pioneer, legal savant, um, you know, e Episcopal priest, like you name it, Polly Murray did it and broke the barrier. Um, and Polly Murray was a, it came around initially opposed the ERA, but came around to being a, an ardent supporter in the end of the ERA. Um, and uh, she said, she said of the ERA, it's the opposition doesn't fear equal rights. What they fear is equal responsibilities. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, so I think it's just important to understand and help people see and hear and know that it never was just a white women's movement and it still isn't today. Um, in all of the states where it's been, you know, resurrected, you know, like I said, Pat Spearman, black queer preacher right. in Nevada is the one who resurrected it there. Um, Juliana Stratton in, in played a big part in ratifying in Illinois. Um, you know, you have Jennifer Carol Foy um, and so many other incredible legislators in Virginia and every state where the ERA hasn't yet been ratified. The women taking it forward in those legislatures are all women of color in Utah. Um, Karen Kwan, Asian American in Arizona. You have Victoria Steele, Native American legislator, senator in Arizona. So in every place where it's being taken forth today, 
today, women of color are leading the way. Um, and that's another incredible thing that the coalition has done is help people understand that it not only isn't a white women's movement now, that it never was. <laughs> right, exactly. With your help, you know, we're, you know, we are, are making that, uh, making that clear, uh, you know, both the chairs of both of our organizations, sister organizations of women of color, black and, you know, uh, and Asian women and uh, our membership, like over 250 organizations now of every particular, you know, uh, aspect of this great river that now supports the ERA. Because it, Kate, as you remember in the beginning when the ERA coalition started, <laughs> We had like three organizations as our partners, and now we have 250 organizations. It was a hearty and small crew at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Kate, you were always kind to us. I remember when you came over to our little tiny office, you know, and, uh, in the days when we had an office, right? And said, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, which was really fantastic. We all said, who is Kate Kelly? And then... <laughs> You know, we, of course, began to know that you're, you know, such a supporter and really. Uh, so talk to us about your path from you are at Equality Now yeah. and, you know, handle the Equal Rights Amendment for them. And then you're at the commission, you know, on, uh, you know, on, with uh, Chair Maloney, you know. Uh, so talk to us about those various aspects yeah, so I got into the ERA in 2012, and I resurrected a group called Mormons for ERA. Um, and so Mormons for ERA was a group started in the 1970s, because one of the main people who opposed the ERA at the time was Orrin Hatch. Um, uh, many things to say about Orrin Hatch, but uh, so Orrin Hatch was one of the main oppositions in the Senate. And they needed Mormon women to stand up and say, like, because he always said, oh, women in Utah don't want this. Mormon women hate the ERA. Uh, and they needed Mormon women to stand up and say, that's not true. He doesn't speak for me. Uh, and so it was actually started by Sonia Johnson, a woman uh, ERA advocate in the 1970s who began Mormons for the ERA, who's actually at my house right now. That's why I was a little bit late. I apologize. Um, I was picking Son Sonia up from the airport. She's now 87. Uh, and is coming back to Utah for the first time uh, in four decades. So um, I'm very excited. But um, so f starting Mormons for the ERA, um, and then I tried to work on the ERA in every capacity. I wrote the ERA bill in 2017 in Utah, um, which we introduced and never got out of committee. <laughs> uh, right. But that same year, luckily... <laughs> Frequent story, right? But yes. yes. So luckily that same year, Pat Spearman was hard at work in Nevada and she was successful, even though we weren't in Utah. Um, and and so I worked out on it at the state level. Uh, then I went, like you said, to Equality Now, an, a, an international organization and helped them kind of get re-engaged in the ERA fight. And then I was like, OK, what what where can I go? What what needs to be done? How can we move this forward? Um, so I did, I worked uh, for the better part of two years, I worked in Congress um, for the Committee on Oversight and Reform. Carolyn Maloney, long time, incredibly, like, you know, just indistinguishable fire for the ERA um, in Congress. And so we did many things, including we had a, hosted a hearing uh, in October, first uh, full committee hearing on the ERA in, in uh, I think, 40 years. Um, and Carol was a witness, an incredible witness. Um, yeah. And we were able to, through our hearing, we were able to sort of bring a more modern picture to the ERA. And like, like I said before, you know, change the visual image of who supports the ERA, um, including um, Bambi Salcedo, who is on the ERA coalition board and also the founder of the Trans Latina Coalition. Bambi gave incredibly power, powerful testimony in Congress. Um, she started out her speech in Spanish, which like had all the Republicans like very jittery um, and uh, gave a wonderful speech about why trans people need the ERA and why we need to use the ERA as a tool to protect the most vulnerable, including trans women of color. Um, and she she just I just remember her one of her lines. She said, I have experienced things that you cannot even imagine. Um, I have been through so much and it was, it was a really, really powerful contribu contribution to the conversation. So, um, we're so, so lucky to have her on our board. We, we have two trans, uh, members, uh, Bambi Salcedo and Drew Laos here. 
and they you know bring so much to the understanding again of bringing this discussion into the future of what are we talking you know what exactly are we talking about when we talk about equality right yeah and the equality is for everyone and so i feel like you know there uh the movement is changing in a good way um, I see the future of the movement being much more inclusive, uh, you know, of reproductive rights, of trans rights, of all these different things that, you know, people have been more skittish about in the past. Um, and I feel really great about the place that it's going. I, it's appealing to more young people. I did an event yesterday in D.C. and a bunch of the teen teenager ad, advocates from the uh, Generation Ratify came and I love them. They're so wonderful. Okay. They came uh, to LA, you know, Rosie. Yes, came they told to me. They told I me. Know, it was so, so wonderful. Kate, you've done terrific work with them. <laughs> you know, that is really, you, you know, you really have, although they, I must say, are, are you know, incredible <laughs> themselves. Wow. They're, the story I always tell is, you know, the coalition is, you know, sort of this, you know, sort of state, you know, and we send them petitions and things, letters that we want to send out, you know, to get their signature on it. And they inevitably send it back and say it's not it's not intersectional enough, it's not intergenerational enough. Fix it and we'll sign it, which is just fabulous. So that's so you know, so, you know Rosie Couture and her gang, right? Yeah, and and Blaine and Annabelle yeah. and yeah, they're all incredible. And I think that there's something about that intergenerational story at like I it tells in the book, you know, generation after generation, it's been a hundred years and we still don't have it. But, but I think that's frustrating, but at the same time, it speaks to me about the, the power of the movement and the sort of timeless need for the ERA. The fact that someone in 1923 thought we needed it and even teenagers in 2022 think we need it. Um, the fact that it has that staying power, that appeal, that eternal urgency, I think really speaks to um, the, the, you know, the dire need for the amendment. And, and it's, it's, it's a concept that everyone can get. Yes, there are a lot of details. You know, I like to call them outstanding legal issues. So yes, there are some outstanding legal issues. Uh, but the concept of equality, the 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 bedrock of the ERA is something that everyone can understand. And that's why I called it ordinary equality. You know, when I put when I proposed the name ordinary equality for the podcast, the producers were like, mm, that's kind of boring. <laughs> um, you know, I don't I don't know if we can lure people in with ordinary equality, but I was like, that's what I want. I want people to understand it's so straightforward. It's it's such a no brainer that that we should just it, it should be a given that we have constitutional equality. And then from there, that's the floor, not the ceiling. Right, right. Well, you, you've written uh, because many of us think that because of uh, the retraction of rights, you know, for for women uh, and in the in its larger, you know, understanding is so clear um, that uh, that it's sort of the last stand for 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 these particular rights for equality for anybody. Uh, and I noticed that you not not that I noticed we were thrilled uh, to see your article in. Uh, Oprah's uh, uh, digital universe there, the Hearst universe, talking about reproductive rights, transgender rights, that perhaps the ERA is the vehicle for that. So talk specifically about that, since we are in a particular moment, uh, especially for reproductive rights in, in, in this area. Yeah. I mean, there's no like five alarm fire that's too hyperbolic at this point. Like we're, things are dire. We are losing Roe in June, whether in name only, it, it may remain in name only, but it is going to be completely gutted. There's no question about that. It's um, just a question of how transparent they're going to be. Um, and so I think anyone who cares about reproductive rights and justice needs to understand that, like, we have to have a new and fundamentally different approach. And the only way that we can get not only save Roe, but get what we actually deserve, which is access to health care, regardless of our circumstances. Um, and the only way to get that is if we get the Equal Rights Amendment. 
Um, there have been, there are a lot of state ERAs. I think there are 26 states, um, maybe 28. I forget what count we're at, but there are, um, majority of states have state ERAs and those state ERAs have been underutilized, but there have been some really good decisions on abortion access in those states. Of course, the opponents to the ERA always trot them out. <laughs> you know, you've been at hearings where they print them out and put them on every seat and they print, you know, New Mexico, Connecticut, they're always very, they're trying to warn us against these things, but I see those decisions as very positive. You know, in New Mexico, they struck struck down the state um, state level Hyde Amendment under the state ERA. Um, the right. Hyde Amendment is horrible and needs to be struck down. And the only way that we could do that at a federal level at this point is if we change the Constitution. Um, and I think we should be really proactive about these things because this, these are the issues that people care about now. These are these are the issues particularly young people care about. Um, that trans rights is another example. You know, if you if I'm in a room with anyone under the age of you know like 20, at this point, you ask when they when they ask questions about the ERA, they shoot up their hands, and the first question they ask is about trans rights. Will it cover right. trans people? Will it cover non-binary people? And the answer is very clearly yes. Uh, the ERA will cover uh, this. The, a fun fact about the ERA that most people don't know is that the ERA does not include the word women. Right. The, word, the, the word women is not in the ERA. Um, right. It says on the basis of sex and, 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 you know, God bless the people who wrote it back in the 1920s and then revised it in the 1940s, because that's what we have now. And now we can use that expansive language to cover people of all marginalized genders and people who are suffering discrimination on the basis of sex of any gender. So um, because of a recent case called Bostock, in the Bostock case, and what they decided is that that exact same language on the basis of sex also applies to um, gender orientation, I'm sorry, gender identity and sexual orientation. So we have a very clear and recent precedent that that language does cover trans people. Um, and I think we should be shouting that from the rooftops. I know, I know when people, you know, a reporters call, you know, you know, and they so, sort of say, well, you know, there are people who are saying that this also covers transgender. And I say, absolutely, as it should, as it does, case closed, please move along. You know, it's, you know, so that we don't need to debate that. Um, but uh, so I, I do want to get your, because I know that people may have questions for you and I hope they're going to be ordering your book. Uh, it is just fantastic. You know, I, you know, it, I would say that it it's a total game changer in terms of making, you know, that give us the short version of the ERA, the meaningful, the point, you know, it's like, what are you, uh, for the people who say, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I mean, this, this will answer that question, but, you know, your prog prognosis about uh, the future in terms of when and how and all of that. <laughs> I'm going to give like a very annoying lawyer answer, um, which oh, wow. is, I don't, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know when the ERA is going to happen. I, I feel, you know, we're, as you say, and as I say, frequently we're closer than we've ever been. And that's true. And I feel like we just need to imagine, like, imagine if the Republicans were like, one signature away from changing the constitution, what would they do? You know, it would be like five alarm fire. They would be like marching in the streets. They would be, you know, that's what we need to do. We are one signature away from changing the constitution and that's the national archivist. Um, and I, I go into more about this in the piece that you mentioned in Oprah. Um, but there are th there are three paths forward for the ERA. One is in the courts. It's currently being litigated and the archivist is being sued. One is through the executive branch. Uh, President Biden could instruct the archivist to just proceed and certify and publish the amendment. This is my favorite route. Um, and then uh, the third route is through Congress. Congress, um, the House already has passed the deadline ex elimination bill and the House, the Senate has uh, 52 sponsors, co-sponsors. That's more than 50. Um, and so I think there are there are multiple pathways forward for the ERA. And I think we need to act as as they would act if they were so close, if they were like in this tiny, like penultimate step to actually changing the constitution, um, we need to act with that sense of urgency. 
and and we'll get it done. I don't know if it's going to be this year or if it's going to be in 10 years, like Crystal Eastman. You know what I mean? I feel like if I said it's going to be done this year, they'd be like, in 10 years, they'd be like, remember when she thought it was going to be done in one year? Um, so I'll be, I'll be optimistic. But the reason I'm optimistic is it really is catching the zeitgeist. You know, this book, um, I thought, oh, you know, it's a pretty niche issue. And I don't know if it's, you know, I want it to be out there, but I, do, I, I tried to sell it to bigger publishers and they, you know, the big five all turned me down. Um, my incredible publisher, Gib Smith in Utah, picked up the book and really went with my vision. Um, but I didn't know, you know, I didn't know if it was going to be popular. And it the release date is still not even until April. Um, and it's already in the third print. So they they went through the first printing, second printing, and third printing just with pre-orders. Um, and so I feel like it's really catching a, a moment. You know, I think the ERA is getting more prominent. People are talking about it. President Biden made two statements about it already this year. That's not nothing. You know, he's not exactly doing what we want him to do yet. <laughs> I know. We all, we all said thank you, but, you know. You, but let's, let's go ahead and get it done. Um, the coalition's, you know, uh, always works on all ways forward. So we're working on all of those of things. Coming, coming, reading your book and seeing the stuffs, I really think, you know, could we really mobilize, you know, a fiery gathering? You know, I mean, we really need, I mean, you know, we really, really need to do this now and we need to get out in the streets, even though I keep saying we've been in the streets for so long, you know, let's. It would be so wonderful if we could just get them to do it in the Senate, you know, or, in the, you know, without, but I, I just, you know, really think that we've got to find, because really more, I mean, the ERA is at stake. And also, as we all know, our democracy is at stake. I mean, it is really, you know, those, those, the three, three things of voting rights, equal rights and reproductive rights are all on the line so dramatically and tragically you know, that this year really is, is extremely important to do something. It's now or never. It's Let's just do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's get it done. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> do it. All right, ER, I'm going to have you come back and, and, and handle uh, any questions there may be for Kate. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So we have one really great question, uh, which is just who is your favorite person in the book? Oh my gosh, this is, I um, had thought about this question before and I'm like, it's so hard. So there are 12 different chapters. Um, each one features a different uh, person along the journey. Ah, oh, favorite person. It's so hard. Um, I, I'm so obsessed with all of them at this point. I'm going to say Crystal Eastman. Uh, Crystal Eastman is uh, this such a little known figure and even in feminist history. And was so important, played such an important role. So Crystal Eastman was a suffragist, then helped draft with Alice Paul the ERA, advocated and championed the ERA. Crystal Eastman also started the ACLU, which almost no one knows that a woman con conceptualized and started and founded the ACLU. Um, there's like a very, there's some hot tea in the book about how it got stolen from her by a man. Um, when she was in the hospital on pregnancy leave, she literally was, could not leave because she was on maternity leave and she was in a hospital bed and a man came in and like, by the time she got out of the hospital, his name was on the letterhead of this organization. Boo. Um, so, um, but Crystal Eastman, is, she, she, I know it's horrifying. Um, she only lived to 28. Like she was, she died very young, but she lived this incredible life. Um, and that spanned like a real peak in a lot of these different movements. So I love them all. And next time I would probably choose a different favorite, but tonight I'll say Crystal. <laughs> well, you can choose a different one in every okay. reading and that's <laughs> great. Good heads, I would say, right. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Thank you for that fun fact. I've already learned lots of things that I didn't know. And I thought I like, you know, it was pretty well versed. So, I am sure folks watching at home are going to want to pre-order Ordinary Equality. It really does help us when you buy your books from Karis. So um, you can click this teal button at the bottom of your screen, and that will take you directly to the link to pre-order it. The book officially now comes out on April 26th, I believe. Um, 
originally when we planned this event, it was going to be uh, hot off the presses. At this time, due to supply chain stuff, it's been pushed. But um, as as Kate said, the book has already gone through several printings. That's a huge deal. That, that That's not a normal thing. It's a great thing. So congratulations. That's awesome. That's what we always want to hear. And the best thing you can do to support an author, particularly an author whose politics you believe in, is to pre-order their book and also request it from your local library and get it in your kid's school library so uh and in your college library so as an alum order a copy of a book and donate it to your college library all of those things not only help the author um it also helps the cause right so the more the more you can get the word out the better um of course you don't have to buy all of those copies from Karis, but it does help us uh, <laughs> but, yeah, of course. Uh, i did but, it. I Oh, I wanted to just really quickly say that the book is very geared at a younger audience. So if you're wondering like, oh, you know, is it too, is it, it's, it's not what you would think of a constitutional legal book. Like it is about the constitution, right. <laughs> um, but it's illustrated. The language is very colloquial. I don't get into the nitty gritty. Um, it's really just stories about the people who've been backing the ERA. And I say like anywhere middle school and up. So it is younger people, I think, will really be able to engage with the book. That is so helpful. So, yes, you heard it here. Buy for your child's school. Uh, donate it to the public schools in your district. However, however you do your thing. But it really does matter. And particularly at this time when so many books are being challenged in schools, it is even more important that we get useful information into our schools. So... Um, thank you both so much for being with us. This is truly a delight um, and an honor. I'm really grateful to both of you for your work. Um, it, it means a lot for us to get to host uh, activists like y'all. So thank you both. I hope that you stay safe and well, and maybe you'll get to come to Atlanta at some point in the future. I would love that. Thank right. you so much. And you're the first person I've ever met named ERA. So there you go. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. Yes. All <laughs> right. ERA. Kate, love you. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Carol. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.